Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, and yes, can sir. you see my, my screen? Yes, sir. Uh, you are audible, perfectly visible, and slide is also moving perfectly. Sir. Thank you. Well, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you uh, from the University of Kent. Uh, very welcome. Uh, big welcome to the University of Kent, virtually, uh, at least. Um, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit this morning about Operation Magnum, which was the, the first use of familial DNA searching um, anywhere worldwide. Um, I was just checking the, uh, the stats. Um, these murders were uh, now 60 odd years ago. Um, the murders themselves were in 1973. Uh, and for many, many years, uh, we thought um, that we were never going to con convict these individuals. The, the cases had gone, gone long cold. So just a few acknowledgements. First and foremost to ISAR, um, a massive thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you, uh, uh, this international audience. Uh, it's really gracious of you uh, and thank you. Uh, thanks also to friends in uh, uh, South Wales Police, uh, in, in the former Forensic Science Service, and above all, uh, to my, my good friend, Dr. Colin Dark, who actually led on uh, this work during my time uh, at the Home Office. So those were just a few acknowledgements before we, uh, we, we start. And as it says there, we, we looked at the very sad deaths of, of uh, three young women. Um, there are no graphic images, um, but if the content would be upsetting, I'm guessing that that's not probably the, the, the issue with a, a professional audience, uh, but um, um, don't proceed any further. It, it's an emotive topic I, I appreciate. Uh, and above all, let's never, ever forget victims. Um, this, I think, is why we're all in this, uh, this type of business, um, to make life uh, and, and sometimes um, support victims the, the, the most we can using, using science. So these cases um, really rather predate the, the current um, thoughts, the current um, focus on the use of forensic genetic genealogy, um, which came really to, to the fore with uh, Joseph D'Angelo. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit about D'Angelo during the, uh, this talk. Uh, but this one was the, the first one. This was the, the first uh, case worldwide. This was the case of Joseph Kappen, um, uh, a man who uh, went to his death, went to, went to, uh, to, the, to the grave uh, unconvicted. Uh, he'd murdered three girls back in the, the 70s. Uh, and this, of course, was, was many, many years before we had a DNA database. Um, 1973, we still had the, the sort of standard serology tests, uh, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, so this is a, a synopsis, really, of, of the, the case. Uh, it was the first case worldwide, uh, although Kappen had died. Um, it was the first use of the, the, the database to use a a mass screen, uh, and it was the first case where we actually exhumed the uh, uh, the individual, the, the murderer. So we go back to, to 1973, um, 60, uh, 65 years ago now, um, odd. Uh, no, perhaps not as long as that, but uh, we go back to 1973. Um, the backdrop was of uh, girls, two girls particularly being, uh, being murdered, uh, Pauline Floyd, Geraldine Hughes, uh, and Sandra Newton, although um, the, the cases were geographically linked um, and ge linked in, in both time uh, also, um, they were dealt with as separate cases. Uh, and one of the things that I think you have to take your hat off to with the police officers of the day um, was you know, how far-sighted they were. Um, they did archive their materials carefully. Um, and I wonder now, looking back on it, how careful we all were back in the, those days, uh, archiving materials once the cases were over. So that's the backdrop. Uh, South Wales kept these, the evidence from the, these cases. Um, there were three uh, uh, un unsolved deaths. Um, this is poor Sandra, uh, of course, would now have been uh, around about 65 years of age, wouldn't she, born in... in, in uh, um, if she was murdered in 73, she would have been about, so it should now be about 65, I'm guessing. So this is poor Sandra. Um, she was last seen in 1973. She'd been raped, sexually assaulted, and the clothing had been used uh, as a ligature. And, and just to break a little bit from the, uh, the, the, the theme of this, uh, I'm always intrigued when I speak at these conferences, these e-conferences, just how much connection there is. 
there is with other speakers, um, just how much connectivity there is between what, what we were doing uh, and what we're doing in the Forensic Science Service, what we continue to do, uh, and what other people are doing uh, around the world. So that was the, the backdrop of, of, of Sandra's murder. Um, this was just a, 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 an image of where the, the body was, uh, was found. Um, she, this is the backdrop to the, the lead up to finding Sandra's body. Um, she'd been out with a boyfriend, they'd had consensual sex, which of course uh, can, can cause problems um, in terms of mixture interpretation and so forth and so forth nowadays. Um, so of course, uh, the, the Sandra's boyfriend became a, a suspect uh, and for many, many years bore a lot of suspicion um, that he was probably the, 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 the murderer. Uh, he actually wasn't the murderer, uh, but, you know, there, there's sometimes additional victims that we perhaps don't necessarily see victims who were probably wrongly, wrongly accused of these, uh, these offences. Um, so he was uh, eliminated ultimately, but the, the, the finger of suspicion, uh, he will tell you, never really uh, left him. Um, Pauline and Geraldine, so this is now three months later in the same location. Uh, and again, I suppose with the benefits of the hindsight, you, you might say, well, actually, why did we not connect these cases uh, sooner than we did? Um, well, there was, uh, um, th th things have moved on I nowadays. Um, these two girls had gone uh, to, into, into uh, uh, Cardiff, uh, an area of Wales. Um, they'd gone to uh, a nightclub uh, and had hitched the, were, were hitchhiking the way home. Uh, they didn't have the money for a taxi uh, and they hitchhiked, were hitchhiking the way home uh, when they encountered Joseph Kappen. Um, and again, I think we need to pause a moment just to take a, a reflection on, you know, the loss of these two, two lives, a loss of these three lives, in fact, and, and many, many more uh, people who would have been mothers, grandmothers and so forth. So never really, under, never ever underestimate uh, the, the value and the power of uh, forensic science. Um, it's uh, amazing when you can actually do things like this with, uh, with science uh, and make life, make society better for, uh, for, for everyone. So we now move all that the way forward. Um, so the case went cold back in 1975. Um, in the, the later, mid to, to late 80s, of course, we had the, the advent of DNA. Um, and you can see there an image of Alec Jeffries holding up that, that auto, auto radiograph um, of the, uh, the, the, the barcode, the, the traditional barcode type image of the day. Um, clearly not um, very good for, for data, well, no good for, for databasing uh, work, uh, but useful for, for comparing both uh, cases together, all three cases. Uh, and of course, there was a connection between all three cases. Um, so we moved forward now to the 1990s. In the UK, the, the National DNA da Database went live in 1995. So you can see that there was a, a buildup of, uh, uh, of technology from the, uh, the, the mid 90s, uh, the, the early pitchfork case was around about 1987, if I recall correctly. Um, but we had a series of um, technologies, a series of techniques um, that were, were developing. Um, and so science was, was getting better and better. Um, so you'll see within my presentation today that there are a series of QR codes. So any of you who've got your your phone's handy. Um, if you want to probe a little bit more um, on the history of of this, um, literally just take a, a, a screenshot, um, and you'll see that that opens opens up into a, a historical perspective of, of DNA. So if you don't want me to take copious notes, um, there's a link there to uh, to help you. So there was a, a conscious decision, point number eight, the conscious decision was made at the time um, was to actually wait until the, the, the science caught up with these cases. Um, so remember now we're moving all the way forward to 1990, 1990 uh, from the case, cases being committed back in uh, 1973. We knew that things were going to get better. And so uh, 
things it did evolve. We went from a, a very early multiplex, a um, sixplex, um, six sites on the uh, on, on the on the genome uh, back in uh, the, the early days of 1995. Uh, we then went on to um, putting more uh, more loci. It became more and more sensitive, uh, more discriminating, um, and um, we've now moved on to. Um, to, to many to many more so currently we, we have a 17 multiplex in the uk uh, so we look at 17 sites 34 numbers 34 uh, values from both mum and from from dad so in those days we had six from mum six from dad we had 12 uh, numbers of comparison um, we also had the advances of course of, of pcr um, the early forms of, of dna didn't allow us to to use pcr um, the next generations of multiplexes and the next generation of technology uh, did. So we moved on. We went from uh, six, the six sites uh, to, to 10 sites. Um, and we were also able to use PCR both in the, its standard form of, of 28 cycles, uh, but, but sometimes even replicating that even more. Uh, and that's a whole different talk for, for another time. Uh, but we, we could go from 28 cycles of PCR uh, to 35. Um, so the Forensic Science Service were asked by um, South Wales and other police forces. One of the things I led while I was in the Home Office was a, a national review of um, cold cases, national cold case rape review. Um, and we were looking primarily at what was in the, the scientist freezers. Um, instead of actually starting perhaps from the traditional end of investigations, we started by going to the freezers uh, actually looking at what, what samples we had, uh, what those case, what those samples married up with, um, and what we could potentially do with them. Um, so by this time, of course, we could do more and more, um, and science has advanced um, over the, uh, that period. Um, so, um, yeah, point number three there, one of the girls was attacked first, uh, and then the other girl shortly after, um, but they didn't have as much semen. So these new te techniques were becoming much more, more sensitive at work, working with, uh, with smaller uh, parts of DNA. Now we, we move rather fast forward. You, you'll see that I I'm not, don't want to speak directly to, to the slides. Um, I want to try to let you read, read the slides, um, but also to try to add some, uh, some information um, in the margin, if you will. If you want to look at the QR code to the bottom right of your, your screen, um, you'll see that this is one of the study guides I produced at the university uh, to inform our students um, on the, you know, what, where this has gone to, uh, where the, the, the science is now, uh, to, to where it was back in, the, in, in my day. Um, so this is the case of Joseph D'Angelo. Um, of course, there was a, a similarity uh, with the semen that, that we found in those days. Um, similarly, with or using different technology, um, there are similarities, of course, with D'Angelo's cases. Um, and of course, that we, we all know um, that we share 50% of uh, DNA from parents, um, around about 25% with brothers and sisters, uh, about an, uh, an eighth with cousins and so forth. So you can actually see that how you can build those family trees. Uh, and, and that's in essence what we did in our case, um, although we used the, the National DNA Database to do our searching, um, whereas the D'Angelo case used um, SNP technology, I don't know if that's a term that you're familiar with, uh, SMP technology, um, and they use proprietary databases. So people who uh, you know, have donated their, their DNA to find out their ancestry and so forth. So that was the difference between the, the our case and the D'Angelo case. So moving all the way forward now, and I feel really, really old man these days by going back, or I remember all of this, uh, this history. Um, so we're back now into the late twenties. Um, we had produced a profile of the killer. Uh, we've been able to marry together, of course, the subtract the, the victim's DNA um, from all of these cases. Um, and what we were left with was uh, the, the DNA profile of the, the suspect, shall we say. So you all appreciate how that would be done. Uh, we have a mixture of DNA from the perpetrator and the victim. We've got these three cases linked together. 
And I also believe that there are further cases that South Wales Police are actually looking into now. Um, the thought is that this person may not have committed just these three, uh, three murders. Um, so uh, everyone was high-fiving by that time. We got this ma massive national DNA database um, back in 95. Uh, lots and lots of money spent on it. Um, and you can imagine, can't you, uh, when we loaded these samples to the database, um, there was no match. Um, everyone was really crestfallen. Um, so they looked at the, um, the Sandra Newton case also um, and effectively linked all of these three cases to uh, together. Um, and a key date, uh, the procedure back in, in the day, uh, and again, if you want to, um, to look at your QR code, if you want to scan the QR code, you'll see this, this links back to, to one of the lectures that I deliver at the University of Kent um, and hopefully uh, soon a little bit more worldwide uh, to actually get this, this message out even wider. Um, so we knew that we had um, a pro DNA profile of the offender. Uh, we knew we had a profile of the, uh, the boyfriend. Um, we knew that Sandra's case was a mixture of two. Um, we could subtract um, uh, C uh, from Sandra, subtract B from, from that. Uh, and what we actually got with then was, you can see how we were narrowing this down. Uh, so we can actually see that we, it, these cases were matching the killer of both Pauline and Geraldine by subtracting both Sandra uh, and her boyfriend from, uh, from what, was, uh, what the genetic material was left. So these cases then remained unsolved for, for 29 years and there was a conscious decision made. Um, so it's not a, you know, a bad news story. Sometimes a conscious decision is made to actually let the science catch up. Um, but back in, um, we, we had no hits uh, back in 1998, um, very glum we, we all were. So what could we do then? That was the question we were asking then. What possibly can we do after we've, we've got these cases all linked? Um, we have a, um, a, a genetic profile from the person who we think the, the offender is. Um, what can we do? Well, the, the, the traditional method in, in those days was to run what was um, called a, a, a mass screen. Um, and those of you who might um, want to purchase the book, it, it's actually uh, quite a good book. It's a book by Joseph Wambel. Um, and um, the book is called The Blooding. Um, and it tells the story of the Narborough case, the, the very first time in which DNA was used to convict a murderer in the case of Colin Pitchfork. It's by Joseph Wambel, uh, and the book is called The Blooding. And that was a tint, it was, it's called The Blooding because in, the, in, the, uh, in that case, um, they did a mass screen, a, a, effectively a, a gather up of all of the um, uh, volunteers, vol voluntary samples from all the young males, and young male persons in, in the room. In, in the in the uh, area, pardon me. So they did the same on this one. Uh, so they produced a shortlist, uh, swabbed them all. Of course, they were they're all volunteers. None of them sadly matched. Um, so what came along then? Um, by this time, I'd gone to the Home Office. I and others uh, worked on this uh, this guidance. Uh, you see, if you scan your QR code, that opens up into a document uh, which we put together. Uh, at the time to actually inform people how to do familial searching. Um, again, not to be really confused with what's happening in the day in nowadays with forensic genetic genealogy, uh, but, but in, in, a, in a similar way it is. So I'll leave you to make the comparisons. Um, so we asked, you know, was there a, a possible um, close match on the database? If we know that we all share um, you know, 50% of our DNA with mother and father, 25% um, with brothers and sisters. Is there someone on, that, on the database now um, that could actually give us a link to those cases all those years ago? So there were 22,000 potential hits. And for the police officers in the audience, I know that having a, the thought of having 22,000 potential investigative leads probably fills you with, with dread. Um, we need a, a process of, of narrowing those down which is what we did. Um, it was reduced down to 100 possibles. Uh, and now bearing in mind um, that what we're doing now, we're looking for someone who is not on the database. We're looking for a genetic profile 
uh, to get some clues from people who are on the database to link to, to, to people who are not on the database. Um, and we work on this basis. Um, we know that family dispersion is uh, correlated with higher income, with higher education. We also know, um, certainly in, in the UK, not we, we know, but, but you know, criminological theory tells us that criminality does run in families and that offenders uh, operate close to where they live. So the, the notion was if we can find someone who you know, is a close match, um, then it may lead us to, to the actual suspect. Um, in a sense, I've said an, an awful lot of that already, but we, we do inherit DNA from parents. Um, so if you can find a child uh, or an of off the offender through the database, um, but by that time, you know, we were uh, many, many millions of profiles on the database. Um, the other principle, of course, is people don't tend to travel that far. And again, looking back today with you know, the benefits of hindsight, um, these cases were very well connected geographically. Um, so the team um, went through this with, uh, with a ruler, um, effectively on a, on a sort of spreadsheet, uh, worked their way down you know, to see if there was a, a child of the offender um, who they could be, could be looking at. Because remember, at this stage, we still do not have a, a match on the database. We don't have a, a, an absolute match to Pauline, uh, Sandra, Okay, the, all, all of those cases. So it was wrap, ramped up. Um, it was placed on the, the old uh, records, the old paper records were, were uh, gone through um, and was placed on a, a, a major incident system called HOMES, the Home Office uh, Large and Major Inquiry System, um, and produced these, these 500 investigative names, the people who were, were suspects at, at the time. Um, so that was used for producing the, um, the um, uh, mass screen, the, the dragnet type uh, offence, the, um, the dragnet type inquiry. We can use other um, techniques. Um, and again, please have a look at the, the guidance because really this is where, where this came from. We, we can use familial searches. Uh, we know that some um, STRs only only appear on the on the YSTR. We know that some uh, genetic markers only appear on the on the male part of the uh, the chromosome. So uh, we, we there are some scientific tools we can look at rare allele mapping. So alleles, um, genetic markers that are not not as common as others. Uh, and as you can see there, we can do some intelligence led screens, essentially to to narrow down what can we do when we've got all the way through this this wonderful policing work. Uh, all the great science, and we still don't have a match on the database. We can do all of these these things. Um, they went through um, lots and lots of um, of science. Um, so, looking at the sort of base pair repeats, if they were, they were excluding um, people, and it's interesting that to this day, you know, the, the way in which our DNA database works is it works on an exclusionary basis. So, you know, if we you know, we, the first thing we try to do is to exclude someone as a contributor. Um, but of course, if you do get someone who could be a possible match, you, you then want to look at the, the number of, um, you know, how close a match could this be. Um, so there were 80 matching uh, individuals on the common side uh, and nine matching on the rare side. Uh, and these are base, base pair sequences that were, were, were more uh, uncommon than, than others. Um, and within that nine came up the, the name Capen, um, K-A-P-P-E-N. Um, and immediately the police officers recognised this name as someone who'd appeared um, all those years ago in the first inquiry, uh, going back into the, to the 1970s. Um, the, the, this Capen name uh, really got the police officers to sit back and uh, um, reflect on, on how he'd appeared. And he, he was actually a, a suspect in the, the first inquiry. Um, because one of the witnesses had um, identified um, th this, this type of white car, not the, the reg registration number, but this type of white Austin car. They saw this white car um, in a lay-by a few miles from where, uh, where the, the victims were, were, were murdered. Um, he 
the police officers went to visit him, of course. Um, he told them a story that the, the car was un, un, undrivable. It was on bricks. It was on, on blocks um, and they'd been off the road. wasn't being used for, for months and months. So what could we do then? Um, Paul Kappen, by this time, of course, Joseph Kappen is dead. He's long dead. Um, uh, but we have the, the profile of Paul. We have Joseph's son. Uh, and we know, of course, that, of course, that Joseph, uh, he would be half the profile of, uh, of, of Joseph. Um, yeah. So we know that Paul is, is half of, of Joe. Uh, we had one of his sisters. We had one of his mum. So do you see how we can perhaps make this uh, as a piece of like a, a jigsaw where we can start to piece these uh, the genetic uh, puzzles together? Uh, and then what we did was to undertake, um, I said we, the, the Forensic Science Service, Colin and colleagues, um, some reverse paternity. Paternity where we're looking for, um, for the father um, of the, or the parent of the individual and not the general paternity where we're looking for, uh, for the sibling. So we were looking in, in essence to see if we could exclude someone. Um, and if we couldn't, um, then we would try to get a, um, a full profile to see what, what, to, what we, we couldn't get a full profile because of course we couldn't be sure which uh, child we inherited it from. So ultimately, um, although there was a very close match, um, we put together all of this, this genetic jigsaw, um, of course, that there are some, some missing pieces uh, sometimes. So the decision was made uh, at the time to, uh, to exhume Joseph Kappen, uh, and he was the first person to be exhumed with uh, using DNA, uh, using DNA clues to, to identify him. Um, quite a scary uh, experience, I understand, from those who were there, uh, but in our jurisdiction over, over here, um, the, usually, um, the, of course, the coroner, we've heard a lot about the coroner this morning, the coroner would have to give permission uh but that was only of course if there's going to be a court case uh we know on this occasion that, that joseph kappen was dead so there was there wasn't going to be a court, court case there was probably going to be an inquest again but to a, um there wasn't going to be, certainly going to be a court case so that then had to be signed off by the home secretary a uh, person who i by that time worked uh, alongside in the home office uh, and that was the first time an exhumation had been uh, order had been signed in this way uh, and as I said, it's quite a, a scary experience for um, for those who were involved in this this exhumation. Traditionally, all our exhumations are done at night. Um, they're done in uh, the, the, the tent is placed over the coffin, and you can see there the the, the, the uh, tent is lit from the inside, uh, which stops people peering in. You know, you, you actually can't see any silhouettes from the from the outside. Uh, and this is a verbatim quote in, in point, point number three from the officers. We dug down to the first coffin, lifted it out. Um, interestingly, speaking with the people who were there at the time, uh, they were saying that because the, the, the um, coffins, the, the bodies had been buried on, on a hillside, um, there was a degree of suspicion whether the bodies had actually slipped down the, the hill. Um, so were, were they actually going to find the bodies in the, the position that they, uh, they thought they were? Uh, well, Joseph was um, the middle coffin. Um, there, were, there were three bodies in this grave. Joseph was the middle, um, and so it took a little time to uh, to get to him. Uh, and as as Joseph's um, coffin was being lifted, uh, there was a massive clap of thunder, um, which of course I would imagine scared everyone to to death. Um, two DNA samples were taken from him at the mortuary. Um, just to fill in that those last pieces of the jigsaw. So if you think about it this way, you know, we've, we've got this genetic jigsaw, mostly mostly completed, uh, but this, these were the last two pieces, last few pieces of that, to, that jigsaw. Uh, we sampled from the thigh bone, uh, tooth and so forth. Um, and you can see there that he was dressed in his best suit. He'd, he'd got plastic pajamas on um, and the, the head and the hands were skeletalized, but to, um, so the body was, wasn't perfectly preserved, it had rotted down to a skeleton. Uh, just a little bit more, um, certainly for, for my students uh, over here, uh, how do we extract um, DNA from bone? Again, if you, if you want to scan the QR code, uh, you can see that that's one of the procedures um, using a, a tissue lyser uh, for actually you know, getting DNA from, from bone and from tooth. 
So that was the, the end of this case. Uh, back in 2002, uh, he was exhumed, uh, tooth and femur were sampled, uh, a DNA match obtained. Um, and of course, um, we can now look at uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms um, you, in the case of things like you know, Joseph, the, the Joseph D'Angelo case. Um, so that's really where we, uh, we were. Um, I hope this has been of, of some interest. Um, again, it, it is useful, I think, to look back um, all those years ago to actually see where we, we come from and actually where we go to and, and where we're advancing to even more. Uh, and I think there's more to be heard with those cases of genetic genealogy. So thank you, everyone. Thanks once again uh, for inviting me to speak at your, your conference.